couple things from um, the introduction to the Tempest. And I'm going on the sixth edition because my seventh edition I don't have uh, marked up and obviously wasn't able to do much with it yesterday. Um, the opening paragraph. Shakespeare creates in The Tempest the world of the imagination, a place of conflict and ultimately of magical rejuvenation, like the forest of a midsummer night's dream, in as you like it. Magical rejuvenation. What's another phrase or another word that could be used instead of rejuvenation? What, what is Prospero attempting to do with the various characters? Not his daughter necessarily, not Caliban, but Alonzo, Sebastian, his brother, Antonio, okay, um, Prospero's brother. He's attempting their transformation. Not just reju I mean, rejuvenation just kind of means, you know, CPR. That's not what he's concerned with. He's concerned with changing their characters. Notice, I didn't mention Gonzalo. Why not? He's already good. Gonzalo's already good. But Alonzo, no. He and Prospero were enemies when Prospero was Duke of Milan. Antonio, and you see this throughout so many of Shakespeare's plays, Antonio's the usurping brother, okay? So that relationship has got to be repaired. So one of the things, at least, or one of the words I think that you could use, rather than rejuvenation, transformation, reconciliation, rebirth, Bevington goes on. The journey to Shakespeare's island is to a realm of art, where everything is controlled by the artist figure. Well, yes and no. Why does why does Babington say it's art? Why does Babington say it's art? Because it's illusion. It's illusion, okay? Theseus doesn't talk about art in his speech in Midsummer Night's Dream, which one of you, was it you? Yeah, which David did this morning. What's he talk about? Poet, madmen, lovers, but he doesn't talk about art per se. He talks about imagination. Sure, there's a lot of imagination here. I think Bevington talks about art, why? One, because he's a college professor, was, he's retired now. He's a college professor interested in the arts, okay? What Shakespeare's scholars, I'm kind of careful how I talk about this. What a lot of Shakespeare scholars do is they don't want to jump in the middle and get right at the heart of what it seems to someone like me, Shakespeare's really getting at. Instead, they want to dance around the edges. So what is it that it seems Shakespeare's really getting at? When you look at a play like this, you look at a play like As You Like It, where they go off to the golden wood. And what do we see? We see old Adam and various other people who kind of get transformed into new Adam. I mean, there is an awful lot of Christian symbolism in Shakespeare's plays that a lot of Shakespeare critics don't want to address. Why? Because they don't know how to. Or... Because there's this idea of, okay, so if you're going to talk about Christian symbolism, which kind? You immediately get into this idea of denominational kind of factionalism without having this approach maybe of, you know, the C.S. Lewis kind of approach that there's a mere Christianity or there is a foundation set of beliefs that pretty much all Christians agree to. Yeah, or, you know, foundational stuff. Birth, resurrect, uh, death, resurrection of Christ, etc., the fall in the Garden of Eden, blah, 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 without getting into 
the Calvinist perspective, the Catholic perspective, the Baptist, the Methodist, which there weren't Baptists and Methodists at this time, okay? But there's, you know, central truths, so to speak, that it seems to me at least Shakespeare is wrestling with all throughout these plays, probably because the time in which he lived was a period of great religious dissension. What is true Christianity? Is it Catholicism? Is it Anglicanism? Is it Calvinism? Etc. So the journey to Shakespeare's Island is to a realm of art where everything is controlled by the artist figure. Okay, the artist figure. Does Prospero ever refer to himself as artist? No, he refers to himself as what? Magician. Yet the journey is no escape from reality, for the island shows people what they are, and then look at the next clause, as well as what they ought to be. Okay? And I don't think Bevington probably would think of it this way. But that, I think, is at the heart of what I'm suggesting is this kind of Christian ideology. What they are, fall, fallen humanity, what they ought to be, what they were intended to be before the fall. So you have here on this little island, before the fall, after the fall kind of an idea. Is anybody um, perfect? No. But what does the quote-unquote art suggest? Can it be attained? Maybe not. Can it be striven for? Definitely. In other words, we can strive to be, as Bevington writes, what they ought to be. Okay? He gets some information about the possible, you know, source material. There is no direct literary source. I mean, this, this seemingly comes entirely out of Shakespeare's mind, which is kind of interesting, seeing as it's the last thing he singly authors. 1611, we know it was performed at court in 1611, okay? And fairly soon afterward, 1612, he moves back to Stratford. Because he's done. I mean, we know that as a fact. He moves back to Stratford. He no longer is involved in the London theater scene, other than possibly assisting some other writers, you know, tweaking some scenes and passages of theirs. Um, he goes on. Towards the end of that long first paragraph, Miranda sees on the island, quote, a new world, unquote, in which humankind appears brave, Act 5, Scene 1. And although her wonder must be tempered by Prospero's rejoinder that tis new to thee, and by Aldous Huxley's still more ironic use of her phrase, the island endures as a restorative vision. Now, I... I've, I find the, the bringing in of Aldous Huxley in that comment kind of odd. Because look at the sentence without the Huxley reference. Miranda sees on the island a new world in which humankind appears brave. And although her wonder must be tempered by Prospero's rejoinder that tis new to thee, the island endures as restorative vision. Endures. That means today. That's why he brings in Huxley. Between Shakespeare's writing and Huxley's writing, Brave New World in 1930, okay, you got to look at the two together, Bevington is saying, for how we understand that kind of phrase. Okay. A um, couple more paragraphs on. See, this is one. Fifth paragraph. The illusions created on the island serve to test these imperfect men and to make them reveal their true selves. Only Gonzalo, who long ago aided Prospero and Miranda when they were banished from Milan, responds affirmatively to illusion. 
in his eyes, their having been saved from drowning, is a miracle. Is that because he's deluded? I mean, if he's responding to illusion, then what? He's not seeing properly. In his eyes, they're having been saved from drowning is a miracle. They breathe fresh air, the grass is green, their very garments appear not to have been stained by the salt water. Appear not to have been stained? What Gonzalo says when we get to that scene is, they've been washed clean. That's not appear not to have been stained. In other words, Gonzalo has what that differs from everybody else that was on the ship. He's got a different perspective. He sees through a different set of lenses than everybody else does. Okay? Sebastian and Antonio, skipping a few lines, react to the magic isle as to Gonzalo's commonwealth by cynically refusing to believe in miracles. What does that mean, cynically refusing to believe? They don't see them even though they're right in front of them. Okay. Gonzalo is open to the possibility. Sebastian and Antonio aren't. Because they're not open to the possibility, they don't see the possibility. They scoff at Gonzalo for insistently looking on the bright side. Is Gonzalo looking on the bright side or is he seeing things as they are? As opposed to um, Antonio and Sebastian. Skip several more lines down. The villains must be taught that an unseen power keeps track of their misdeeds. Well, within the context of the play, what's the unseen power? Prospero. But does Shakespeare want us to understand that? Solely is within the context of the play. Or does he want the play to be, as with the opening of Henry V, imagine this round O to be what? Really the world. The stage, the fields of Agincourt. Imagine this round O, or this island, to be what? The world. What's the unseen power? It's not Prospero. It's not the Wizard of Oz standing back there pulling the levers and stuff. Okay? I think Shakespeare's trying to get his audience who might have become a little bit jaded by this time because of the religious dissension going on in Elizabethan and early Stuart England to, you know, sit back and just, you know, observe, allow for possibilities. So, skip the rest of the introduction. Uh, yeah, take that back. Caliban. What is Caliban? Notice what you get if you rearrange some of the letters. Caliban, replace the N and the L. Cannibal. Okay. Not meaning a literal cannibal. But what is he? Is he fully human? Is he a quote-unquote savage, an uncivilized person? Bevington writes, a few paragraphs on, at the lowest level of this traditional cosmic and moral framework in Pros Prospero's view are Stefano and Trinculo. What, what do they spend the play doing? Drinking, Drinking and plotting. Okay. Their comic scenes just oppose them, juxtapose them with Cannibal and then Bevington states, for he represents untutored nature. The natural man unadorned by civilization. Okay. Whereas they represent the unnatural depths to which human beings brought up in civilized society can, notice the term, fall. This play has an awful lot to do with the original fall and rising up from that. Okay? Turn to the Dramatis Personae. 
Alonso, <laughs> king of Naples, Sebastian, his brother, Prospero, the rightful Duke of Milan, Antonio, his brother, the usurping Duke of Milan, Ferdinand, son of the king of Naples, Gonzalo, an honest old counselor, and then you have a couple of lords. You have Caliban, savage and deformed slave. We don't know what the deformed means. Is he hunchbacked? Is one arm withered? But what does deformed mean? Literally. To not be formed. D, out of, away from, for, shape. It's like he's fallen away from the form. Okay? If you think form as being like Plato's realm of the ideals or ideas, then Caliban is an imperfect copy or an imperfect version of this. Trinculo, a jester, Stefano, drunken butler, Miranda, daughter to Prospero, Ariel and Eri spirit, and then several other spirits. Yes? I can't remember, was Shakespeare an only child? Because he sure seems to have a hatred of younger brothers or just a, <laughs> a bad opinion of them. Yeah, I don't think he was an only child. I, man. I've read He's Michael Woods in Search of Shakespeare a couple of times. To prefer the older brothers. <laughs> I'm just, I'm completely drawing a blank as to whether or not he had any brothers or sisters. But I don't think he was an only child. I just didn't know if there was any story on... I think my mind's like the Department of Mysteries. I mean, I can't, I can't, I completely cannot open that door at all. There's, it's, there's just total blankness. Wow. Maybe it'll come to me. <laughs> Man, I am just, it's completely gone. Okay, so the play opens how? A tempestuous noise of thunder and lightning heard. So somebody backstage, big piece of sheet metal, which they had. <clears throat> That's what they would use to make the sound of thunder and such. So we hear the bosun and the master talking. Ship goes down. Okay. And the mariners and others come out on the stage. And... We're going to skip a bit. Antonio says, line I don't know, 62 or so, 63 maybe, let's all sink with the king. Sebastian, let's take leave of him. Okay. Who's Sebastian again? The king's brother. Okay. So Antonio says, we should die with the king. Sebastian says, let him die by himself. Let's live. Gonzalo. Now would I give a thousand furlongs of sea for an acre of barren ground. Long heath, brown furs, anything. Thy wills above be done. Excuse me. Thy wills above be done. But I would fain die a dry death. And what happens? Quote, unquote, his prayer is answered. Okay. Prospero comes in with Miranda. Prospero, in his magic cloak. I've seen this play a few times. Prospero comes out, and there's magical symbols on it. Or there are just symbols that nobody knows what they mean, except for Prospero. And she says... If by your art, my dearest father, you have put the wild waters in this roar, allay them, calm the oceans. The sky, it seems, are poured on stinking pitch, but that the sea, mounting to the welkin's cheek, dashes the fire out. The ocean is rising up to the heavens. Oh, I have suffered with those that I saw suffer. So apparently she was on some kind of promontory, and see, she... she 
she saw the ship go down. Okay. He says, be collected. In other words, don't worry. No more amazement. Tell your piteous heart, no harm done. He says, no harm. I have done nothing but in care of thee, of thee, my dear one, thee, my daughter, who are ignorant of what thou art. Okay? So, before we go on, I've done nothing but in care of thee. Everything I do as a magician is for what? You. Your well-being. Okay? Why does he say that she is ignorant of what she is, of what thou art? She doesn't know she is the, I don't, what, what is the daughter of a duke? Not a duchess. But maybe she is. Something of Milan. Not knowing of whence I am, nor that I am more better than Prospero, master of a full poor cell, and thy no greater father. You don't really know who you are. Why? Because you don't really know who I am. I am more than just Prospero in charge of this little poor cell. How long have they been here? Since she's about three or four. Because he's going to ask her in a few moments, do you remember anything from our life before? She goes, more to know did never meddle with my thoughts. I, I, I was never curious about it. Tis time I should inform thee. Why? Well, she's going to start meeting people. He might want to bring her up to speed about where they come from. So he puts down his cloak and staff and says, lie there my art. His cloak and his staff are his means of art. Without them, he's powerless. Wipe your eyes, etc. The direful, spec direful spectacle of the wreck, which touched the very virtue of compassion in thee, I have with such provision in mine art so safely ordered that there is no soul, no, not so much perdition as an hair betid to any creature in the vessel which thou heardst cry. Now, there's an awful lot of biblical stuff going on there. Christ in one of his might be Sermon on the Mount, can't remember exactly, says to his followers, you know, take no thought for the day or for the morrow. Why? The lilies in the field, you know, they don't, and look at them. The sparrows are fed, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, not a sparrow falls that God isn't aware of. Every hair on your head is numbered. He just said, we haven't lost as much as a single hair on any one of those men on that boat. Okay? Sit down. Now I'm going to teach you some more. So, he says, the virtue of compassion in thee. What is compassion? Literally. We ought to start teaching etymology. <laughs> Co, with, together, Passion. Suffering. It's suffering with someone. Okay, but what do we really mean by it? Sympathy? Empathy. Feeling with. Love. That's what we traditionally mean by compassion. It's love. He says, by the virtue of your love, by the power of your love, I have with such etc etc so she says you know you, you you started to tell me in the past but you always stopped so why why go on now the hours now come the very minute bids thee open thine ear obey and be attentive do you remember a time before we came here she said yes well okay tell me what what do you remember? Do you remember a house? Do you remember a person? I anything. She says, um, four or five women attended me. So what does that in and of itself say? Bad luck. 
had money and or power, prestige, right? You said you did. But how is it that this lives in thy mind? What, what seest thou else in the dark, backward, and abysm of time? If thou rememberst aught ere thou camest here, how thou camest here thou mayst. If you can remember anything before, then you might remember how we ended up here. Nope. But that I do not. Me trying to remember Shakespeare's family. It's, <laughs> she's blacked it out because there's, you know, something going on. He says, 12 years since, 12 years since, thy father was the Duke of Milan and a prince of power. Notice, thy father. He doesn't say I. So she asks, are you not my father? Well, thy mother was a piece of virtue, and she said you were my daughter. And thy father was Duke of Milan and his only heir, and Princess No Wars this year. What foul play had we that we came from thence? Or blessed was it we did? Notice the two options. Who did wrong against us that we ended up here? Or is it a blessing that we ended up here? Okay. Prospero, both. It was foul play, but a blessing came from it. By foul play, as they say, were we heaved thence, but blessedly hope helped hither. Okay, Who hoped them there? Gonzalo, we're going to be told. Okay, But I think Shakespeare has a biblical parallel in mind. The Old Testament story of Joseph. What happened to Joseph? He kept having these dreams. His brothers were bowing down to him in the dreams. So what do his brothers do? Fake his death and sell him into slavery. Fake his death and sell him into slavery. He gets bought as a slave, taken off to Egypt, kind of rises in power. Potiphar's wife gets the hot for him, plays a Guinevere on him. He gets thrown into prison again. Baker and butcher and candlestick maker, you know, get thrown into prison. Joseph tells them the meanings of their dreams. They get released. Pharaoh has a dream. One of them remembers Joseph. Joseph's brought to Pharaoh. He answers Pharaoh's, translates Pharaoh's dream for him. And boom, rises up to be the most powerful person in the kingdom. And then his family come because, you know, of famine. And what does Joseph say? Long story short. You intended evil, God intended good. In other words, blessedly was I helped hither. But he kept them going with illusion. Yeah, he kept them going with illusion for quite a while. I mean, he kept sending them back, bring your little brother out, don't break dad's heart. You don't bring your little brother, this brother dies. Okay? And then he finally he can't maintain the, uh, the illusion. So, Prospero says, my brother, thy uncle, Antonio, mark me that a brother should be so perfidious. Yeah, he does seem to have something with brother. <laughs> You're right. I never really thought about that. Thought about it that way. He whom next thyself of all the world I loved, and to him put the manage of my state at that time through all the seniors, blah, blah, blah. I was Prospero, the prime duke, that is first, eldest, foremost, being so reputed in dignity for the liberal arts without a parallel, those being all my studies. So what did he do? All I wanted to do was read books, study the liberal arts. And so he did what with his power? With his authority as duke. Transferred it to his younger brother. So he could keep going about his studies. This is related to that great chain of being. You, know, you got the chain, human realm, who or what is at the highest, the king, who or what is at the lowest, serf, peasant, slave, multiple levels within that. Okay, Milan doesn't have a king, 
So what's the highest level there? Duke. What's the highest level in Athens? Duke, etc. in Midsummer Night's Dream. And then you go down. Right? This chain is ordered that way by God slash the gods. Right? What can a human not do within the order of the chain? You can't break it. You can't. The sin of Henry IV replaces a link in the chain. Right? So the chain, the chain isn't right after the deposition of Richard II. Well, what has Prospero done? I don't really want the authority, or another way of putting that, the headaches of rule. Little brother, you do it. Why? So I can go off and do my studies. Okay? By doing that, he is abrogating his rule. He's abdicating his rule. Right? And the great chain of being, if you think of it as a conscious entity, says, no, you, you can't do that. Right? So when he transfers that authority to his little brother, what happens to little brother? Or little brother's head. He kind of likes power. He kind of likes authority. Well, what happens if Prospero wants the mantle of authority back? Kind of like Sauron's ring. Only one person can wear it at a time. So, Prospero says, line 89, I, thus neglecting worldly ends. What are worldly ends? What does the world say to look out for? A couple of things. One, numero uno, yourself. So what is numero uno, yourself, supposed to seek in the world? Power and wealth. Power. Power. Power and wealth. The end of the first Harry Potter novel. Quirrell tells Harry Potter, I learned a lot from Lord Voldemort. Voldemort taught me about good and evil. There is no such thing as good and evil. There is only power in those too weak to seek it. Well, Quirrell then dies. Harry wakes up and Dumbledore says, the stone's been destroyed. The philosopher's stone. Right? And he says, you don't think about it, Harry. It wasn't such a good thing after all. Harry's kind of like, what? He's 11 years old. What do you mean? Because Harry's thinking immortality and untold wealth. Untold doesn't mean I can't speak about it. It means uncountable wealth. Okay? Dumbledore says, the two things most people would want, immortality, unlimited wealth. The problem is humans have a knack for choosing precisely those things that are worst for them. Immortality and untold wealth, are those the two things that are worst for them? If those are the two things that are worst for them, flip that over, then what's the two things that are best for them? He says, I, neglecting worldly ends, power and wealth, dedicated to closeness and the bettering of my mind, with that which, by being so retired, overpriced all popular rate. He could be saying this today. Because what does our society say about real? I mean, let's be honest, get down to brass tacks. About improving your mind. What's the purpose of the university today? Is it really to instill in all of you the quote-unquote liberal arts, I know you're in a liberal arts college. No, it's not. It's to do what? Get you a job. It's to get you a job. MTSU in... Yeah, I'll be hyperbolic. 95% of the universities in the United States are glorified vocational schools. 
Why? The purpose is for you to graduate and get a job. If that's hyperbolic? <laughs> well, Ninety-five percent <laughs> might be hyperbolic. There are still some schools that, not many, <laughs> that do emphasize the liberal arts for the liberal arts' sake, you know, to improve the mind, etc. Yeah, you're right. That's not hyperbolic. It's <laughs> probably more like 99% when you think of the number of universities. I could really only name one off the top of my head that I know is not, actually not, um, vocational in outlook. So he goes on. I overpriced all this stuff. Or, um, let me back up. Dedicated to closeness and the bettering of my mind, without which, by being so retired, or priced all popular rate, that is all popular opinion, in my false brother, what? Await in evil nature. Notice, the evil nature was there. It was just latent. It was asleep. It was under the surface. Well, how did he awake it? Did he go, come here, little brother. Let me work on you. No. He awaked it how? Giving him, power. <clears throat> Giving him a little bit of power. What's the phrase? Give an inch, take a mile. He gets a little taste of power, and what does he want? More. And my trust, like a good parent, did beget of him a falsehood in its contrary as great as my trust was, which had indeed no limit, a confidence sans bound. He's saying, I had what in my little brother? Complete faith. And that complete faith was completely broken. That complete trust was completely obliterated because he as completely wanted power. He being thus lorded, not only with what my revenue yielded, but what my power might else exact, like one who, having into truth by telling of it, made such a sinner of his memory to credit his own lie, he did believe he was indeed the Duke. Talk about illusion. But this isn't an illusion cast by Prospero. This is what kind of illusion? Again, I, I, I think Shakespeare's echoing scripture. Know you not, you shall be as God. That's the lie the, lie the serpent says to Eve. Right? That's the illusion. He did believe he was indeed the Duke. Why? Out of the substitution and executing the outward face of royalty. Outward face. I gave him the mask of royalty, and he took it for reality. What's Prospero really saying here? Technically, I'm still the Duke of Milan. <laughs> okay, I'm shipwrecked on a desert island, but I'm still the Duke of Milan. Gonna, you know, get him a lot when he goes back to Milan, right? If he were to show up at Milan now, dressed as he is, who would the people, you know, pay respect to? Him or his brother? So, Miranda, your tale, sir, would cure deafness. She's saying it's it's just a ringing in my ears. It sounds so sarcastic. <laughs> I know it's not, but I can picture myself saying that to someone. Meaning what? That she's saying what? Get out of here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really? We're royalty? Because how are they dressed? I've seen this perform where they're in ranks. Because they've been on a desert island for 12 years. What's the problem with that? Kind of um, directing. Who does, who does he have working for him? A spirit being who can pretty much do what? 
Yeah. And Gonzalo sent boats with them, right? Yeah, Gonzalo packed the little boat that they went off. He wasn't supposed to, by the way, but he did. But still, I mean, 12 years. Clothes are getting a little old and worn. So, <clears throat> Prospero goes on and says, um, In response to her, your tale would cure deafness. To have no screen between this part he played, and him he played it for, he needs will be absolute Milan. Me, poor man, my library was dukedom large enough. Of temporal royalties, he thinks me now incapable. So he was, in, was confederate with what? The king of Naples. They planned this. To give him annual tribute, do him homage. Subject his coronet, that is, the dukedom, to his crown. And bend the dukedom yet unbowed. Milan never before bowed down to Naples. And now, with his little brother in charge, it was bowing down. Okay. Prospero. Mark his condition and the event, then tell me if this might be a brother. Is he really acting like a brother? Miranda, I should sin to think, but nobly, of my grandmother. She means, I should sin if I were to think anything less nobly of my grandmother. Good wombs have borne bad sons. In other words, it's not grandma's fault that he turned out that way. What else does that mean, though? No one is evil in the womb. No one is evil from birth. Evil is learned. Evil is taught. Okay? Right? Catholicism would teach otherwise. Would yes. Not. So, which Shakespeare was? As... As would Calvinism. Calvinism would go even farther than Catholicism. Okay? But there were, I mean, when, when you talk about original sin, okay, the phrase comes from St. Augustine. It's, it's really complicated. Okay? Because Augustine said original sin is essentially passed on through sex, through intercourse. Why? Because David says, Psalm 50, in sins did my mother conceive me. Which is, gets really twisted in the medieval Catholic Church. So that even in marriage, intercourse is bad. It's wrong. It's sinful. You have to do it. Otherwise, the human race dies out. But you can't enjoy it. What? It's utterly crazy. Okay? And you still had, you know, popes doing it, even though they're supposed to be celibate and all that kind of stuff. St. Augustine is a Western saint. In the Eastern Church, it was never called this. Ever. It was always called the end ancestral sin, meaning the sin of the first ancestor. See, this idea is legal, judicial. Adam sinned, Adam and Eve sinned, therefore they brought guilt upon all of their heirs. Whether you do something or not, if you die when you're a day old and you're not baptized, that's why the medieval Catholic Church taught you go to hell. Why? You're already guilty. That sin, that legal fault has been passed on to you. In the Eastern Church, it was called the ancestral sin. It wasn't legal and judicial. If anything, what's the word I want? Medical, health, uh, physical, I, I can't think of the right word. Sin is an illness. 
It's not a, I broke the law. It's, I've got the flu. Sin is an illness that is brought into humanity. So it's kind of like you can't really help but having it. But it's not. Because I have this illness, somebody else has got to go hang for me, Christ. Rather, it's I've got this illness and I can only be cured. How? By this other individual who is not sick kind of a thing okay she says good wombs have borne bad sons not that the sons are bad in the womb it's because they become bad after this is why you know i think shakespeare isn't real overt because some of his ideas might be just a little bit too radical for the time if if the way I'm reading this is what Shakespeare believed, okay, because it may not be. So Prospero goes on and talks about the king of Naples is his enemy and such, and therefore his brothers kind of become his enemy. Why is he telling her all of this? She's not in this town. Because it's kind of like, yeah, and that ship that wrecked with my spyglass. <laughs> I saw the king of Naples. I saw my brother. I... So, he talks about having been usurped, put at sea. <clears throat> she says, oh, I was a trouble then to you. And he says, no, 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 no. You were like a cherubim that did preserve me. He's kind of saying, if it weren't for you, I would have died. Why? Another Harry Potter reference. They're just all over. I mean, <laughs> unlike Merope Riddle, who did not stay alive for her son, Prospero stayed alive for his daughter so that his daughter would live. How came we ashore? That is, how do we live? By providence divine. No, no beating around the bush there. It's God. Some food we had, some fresh water that a noble Neapolitan. Neapolitan, that means he's from where? <clears throat> Naples. Gonzalo wasn't a Milanese. He's a Neapolitan. Doesn't mean, you know, orange, lemon, and whatever. A noble Neapolitan, Gonzalo, out of his charity. What's the real meaning of the word charity? Caritas. Love. It's not a handout. Okay? Out of his charity, who being then appointed master of this design, that is, the king of Naples put Gonzalo in charge of this, did give us with rich garments, linen stuffs, and necessaries, which since have steaded much. That is, they have steaded us well. We, they've enabled us to live in such. So, of his gentleness, knowing I love my books, he furnished me from mine own library with volumes that I prize above my dukedom. So not only did he give us stuff to survive by, he gave me some reading material so I wouldn't get bored. You know, the old Harvard Library, five-foot you know, shelf of books kind of a thing. Everything you need to know, all the important reading in the world, was supposedly published in this five-foot shelf of books. Just Google it. It's a pretty extensive list. Okay? Would I might but ever see that man? Why? She's saying, I, I wish I could thank him. Prospero, now I arise. Does that simply mean he's getting up off the ground? Okay, literal? Yes. What else is he saying? Now I'm going to put on my magical cloak, take my magical staff, and I will, you know, rise up. Here in this island, here, he says, in this island we arrived. Here have I, thy schoolmaster, made thee more profit than other princes can that have more time for vainer hours and tutors not so careful. During the 12 years you've been here, he said, he says, 
I have given you much profit. Up here, intellectual, not monetary. So he says, here's some more stuff you need to know. By accident, most strange, bountiful fortune. Accident or fortune, they're not the same. He's not using bountiful fortune as an appositive. Accident just means pure blind chance. Fortune, however, is a minion of divine providence. Isn't it in here where I've talked about, have I talked about Boethius? No. Real briefly. Boethius, 6th century Roman, friends with the Germanic Roman emperor, Theodoric, is accused of conspiring against Theodoric. So he's thrown into prison. Capital offense. He's going to die. While there, he writes a little book. The Consolation of Philosophy. One of the most important books written in the Western tradition. It is the most copied book in the Middle Ages. I mean, it seems hugely important. Okay? What does it mean, the consolation of philosophy? It doesn't mean he's sitting there in his cell and reading Aristotle and Plato and Socrates and go, oh, I feel so much better that I'm going to lose my head in a few short years. This just really helps me understand. No. The consolation of philosophy is the goddess philosophy comes to him and consoles him. How? She tells him. Everything that happens, happens for a reason. Happens for a purpose. Here's how she does it. Boethius, this is your life. Beginning, ending. Right now you're here, you're sitting in jail, and what are you looking forward to? Not looking forward with hope and anticipation, looking forward, looking ahead to death. <laughs> the swinging of, a, of an axe. He's not happy about it, okay? He's like, yeah, tell me how this works, because I'm a quote-unquote good Christian. And she says, well, Boethius, here's your problem. You need a different set of glasses, essentially. You need to take a different perspective. Well, what perspective does he have? What perspective do each one of us have about our lives? When James gets up every morning, what does he think? Today, I got a slide through another day. Sure looks like it. What else? Then the next day, and then the next, we live lives how? Linearly. What do we not see? The higher picture. That is, we don't see how today relates with yesterday. And how yesterday related with a year ago. Related meaning how they're connected. Okay? So, she says, Boethius, you need to understand. The world's like this. Okay? And down here in the world, we have fortune in charge. Fortune is a goddess <clears throat> created by God to kind of rule the events here. You know, faith or private we and all that kind of stuff. And what does fortune do? Fortune turns her little wheel. Okay? Well, behind fortune, outside the sphere of Earth, there's something else. Greek fate. Fortune can't overrule fate. Fate controls fortune. Well, that sucks, right? I mean, you'd, you'd rather think, you know, at least with fortune, you got a 50-50 chance. Fate, it's completely dark. I mean, look what happened to Oedipus because of fate. But it doesn't stop there. Because behind and above fate is providence, a.k.a. God. God rules everything. Fate doesn't happen and God goes, oh, didn't see that happening. Shoot. Now, how am I going to fix 
Adam and Eve screwing up. Son, come here, I got a job for you. It's not a surprise. Why? Why did I draw this set of lines? Because everything here is in time. God is outside of time. Okay? God's perspective, let's expand the timeline. Beginning, end of time. What's God's perspective on time? Remove providence for a minute. Eyeball. Time is what? Now. Everything in time, according to Boethius, is the eternal present for God. So here, Adam and Eve screwing up. Here, book of Revelation, now. That's why St. Paul can say, if Boethius is right, that's why St. Paul can say that before the foundations of the world, Christ was crucified. Before the foundations of the world, before time. Why? God sees everything. Boom. At once. That's how you can have foreknowledge. Foreknowledge is not the same as predestination. Predestination is kind of more this. But foreknowledge is, I know what's going to happen. Why? Because it's happened. <laughs> From God's perspective. So, I don't remember how I got off on that. Where were we? Um... Yeah, okay. I just wish the brain's so fried. Um, yeah, by accident most strange, bountiful fortune, now my dear lady, hath mine enemies brought to this shore. Fortune has brought the enemies. And by my prescience I find my zenith doth depend, my zenith, my highest point, upon a most auspicious star, whose influence if now I court not but omit, my fortunes will ever after Droop. Fortune will keep turning her wheel, and if I don't seize this opportunity, so stop asking me questions. Thou art inclined to sleep, and notice, tis a good dullness, and give it way. I know thou canst not choose. You know, and he does the Jedi mind trick, and she's sound asleep. Well, why does he put her to sleep? He's got work to do. He, he, he needs her out of the way. So he calls Ariel and talks to Ariel, says, have you done what I asked? Ariel says, yes. Prospero asks, are they safe? I can't believe we're still only in that one. Are they safe? Not a hair perish. Well, what did he say earlier? Not a hair would suffer perdition. On their sustaining garments, not a blemish. Okay, so Ariel says this. It's not merely in illusion or appearance like Bevington suggests in the introduction. But fresher than before. Well, how can they be fresher than before? Does that merely mean, you know, they've been in the boat in a while and their clothes are kind of stinky and smelly and now they've, you know, been through the washing machine and the Tide has cleaned them. Fresher than before. And as thou baits me, in troops I have dispersed them about the isle. In other words, there's a group over here, and there's a group over here, and there's a group over here. And notice, Prospero has Ariel put them in specific groups. The king's son have I landed by himself. Why? Because he wants Miranda to meet him alone. He's already, you know, planning out her wedding and all that. Whom I left cooling of the air with sighs in an odd angle of the aisle, that is corner, and sitting his arms in this sad knot. 
in aerial desserts. It's like the king's son is just going to pout. Okay. So they keep talking. Ariel, 243. Is there more? Since thou dost give me pains, let me remember thee, that is, remember to thee, remind me what thou hast promised, which has not yet performed me. What is it Prospero has promised Ariel? Freedom. But he hasn't given it yet. How now? Moody. What is it thou canst demand? My liberty. Before the time be out. No more. I promise you freedom when? At a specific time. It won't happen before then. All right? Thou didst promise to bait me a full year. Dost thou forget from what a torment I did thee, I did free thee? Well, what had happened to Ariel before Prospero arrived? The witch Sycorax had Stuck, froze, encapsulated Ariel in a tree. Prospero freed Ariel. I'm not going to say him or her because I don't really know which gender Ariel is. I don't remember. Okay, so they talk about that. We find out about Caliban, that he is the witch Sycorax's son. Prospero says 280, and actually, well, let's skip that, skip that, because we're running out of time. Um, 296, Prospero threatens Ariel. You keep murmuring, and I will rend an oak and peg thee in his naughty entrails till thou hast howled away twelve winters. Pardon, master, <laughs> I will be correspondent to command and do my spiriting gently. In other words, no, 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 don't do that. Okay. So, we hear Caliban's voice. And 230, uh, 232, 322, Ariel um, leaves, and Prospero says, Thou poisonous slave got by the devil himself upon thy wicked dam, come forth. Got by the devil himself? So is Caliban demonic? Is Caliban a Grendel-like character? Well, he's the son of a witch, right? Son of a witch, but a witch is human. Okay? Caliban comes in. And says, His wicked do is ere my mother brushed with raven's feather from unwholesome fin. Drop on you both. A southwest blow on ye and blister you all over. I mean, he's cursing Prospero. So Prospero says, you're going to have stomach problems tonight, etc., etc. Um, skip a bit and pick up with Prospero 347. I have used thee filth as thou art with humane care. What does humane mean? We tend to think of that today as like the Humane Society. Oh, it's treating animals nicely. Humane means what? Humanly. I have treated you with human care, as a human, he says, and lodged thee in mine own cell. I have let you sleep in my own room. Till thou didst seek to violate the honor of my... He tried to rape Miranda. That's what to seek to violate the honor of my child means. Oh, ho, ho, ho! Lord, it had been done. Thou didst prevent me. I had peopled else this isle with Caliban's. Yet yeah, if you wouldn't have stopped me, there'd be little baby Caliban's just running all over the place, he suggests. Abhorred slave. Slave of who? Slave of Prospero? Slave of sin? 
which any print of goodness will not take, being capable of all ill. What is Prospero saying about Caliban? I think he's bringing in again some of the religious discussion of the day with his character. Caliban possibly, big possibly, represents kind of the Calvinistic notion of humanity. Totally depraved. Nothing good. Okay. Notice, which any print of goodness will not take. Well, how does Prospero know that? Because he's tried. He's tried to get Caliban to be good. I pitied thee. Now, he doesn't mean simply, oh, I felt bad for you. He means I showed pity. I acted mercifully to you. Took pains, <clears throat> excuse me, to make thee speak. Taught you language. Taught, <clears throat> excuse me, taught thee each hour one thing or another. In other words, when he met Caliban, Caliban was like what? An animal. It's one way to put it. Let's use, um, it's not Voltaire, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's idea. Noble savage. Why noble? Because according to Rousseau, you know what makes people evil? It's society. It's society. It's other people that makes people evil. So, remove yourself from other people and live long enough by yourself and you will kind of revert to nobility. No. Shakespeare would not agree. Taught thee each hour one thing or another. What does he mean by that? This is called a desk. This is a chair. This is a whiteboard. So the mark, that's what he means. Hour by hour, I did what? Gave you knowledge of the world around you. When thou didst not, savage, know thine own meaning, that is, know what you were, but wouldst gabble like a thing most brutish, when you didn't know what you thought. Why? Can you think? Think about this. Without language. Can you have thoughts without words? You can have images. But if you never learned language, any language, and you have no words to identify things, how can you have ideas? Your mind becomes what? Or without those ideas, without those words, your mind is what? It's just a jumble of images that don't make any sense. Because you don't have the word T-R-E-E -E, to go with tall green thing growing out of the ground. You don't have B-U-I-L-D-I-N-G to well, describe this thing that we're in. <laughs> something else, H-E-L-L-H-O-L-D. -E -L -L -E. um, <laughs> but with Gabble, like a thing most brutish, I endowed thy purposes with words that made them known. In other words, he's saying, Caliban, you did have purpose. That is, you intended something, but you didn't know what. So I gave you words so that you could go, And understand it. Read about Helen Keller before she learned sign language. She talks about, you know, up here just being darkness. And learning sign language was like light, which she never saw. <laughs> she was blind, wasn't she, as well as deaf and mute? Yeah. Yeah. 
been so long how since, did she, I've, how did she learn since I've read about Helen Keller. So, I endowed thy purposes with words that made them known, but thy vile race, though thou didst learn, had that in it which good natures could not abide to be with. Well, what is that in it which good natures could not abide to be with? Evil. <laughs> Evil and good can't mix. That's why I really wonder if Shakespeare is kind of throwing all of his quote-unquote Calvinist eggs into Caliban. And let's, let's see how this theology works out, so to speak. Therefore wast thou deservedly confined into this rock who had deserved more than a prison. Whoa! What does he mean, deserve more than prison? Okay, I think Prospero here, speaking as a father. He tried to rape my daughter. He deserved death, buddy. But that's also what he more literally means by good natures could not abide to be with you. <laughs> you would take advantage of my daughter. That's why I had to move you out, move you away. You taught me language, and my profit on it, of it, is I know how to curse. <laughs> Thank you for teaching me the ability to swear like a sailor. For learn the red plague rid you. It's like bubonic plague. For what? For learning me your language. And post-colonial scholars just love this play. Because Caliban, he's the one being colonized. This is his land that's been taken over by the white colonizer. Okay? And this is the person being colonized saying, to hell with you and your Western culture and everything else. I don't need it. Prospero. Hexy hints. Okay? So, Caliban leaves. Ferdinand comes in. Ferdinand doesn't see Prospero and Miranda. Now, who is Ferdinand? Go back. Son to the king of Naples. Yeah, so prince of Naples. Remember, Ariel said, yeah, he's all alone. So Ariel sings a song. Ferdinand hears it. He's like, what is Where should this music be, in the air or the earth? And Ariel sings another song, one of the most famous of Shakespeare's songs, Full Fathom Five, Thy Father Lies. Of his bones are coral made. Those are pearls that were his eyes, nothing of him that doth fade, but doth suffer a sea change. Suffer a sea change, that is, a change wrought by the sea into something rich and strange. Well, how is... His father going to be changed. If you've not, I'll just let, if you haven't finished the play, I'll just leave that hanging. So, Prospero says to Miranda, uh, the fringed curtains of thine eye advance, and tell me what you see. So, Ferdinand comes out, and Prospero's like, um, so what do you think? What is it? A spirit? Lord, how it looks about. Believe me, sir, it carries a brave form. Your gloss, excellent. But tis a spirit. Well, what other beings has Miranda seen in her 12 years on the island? Ariel, spirit. Her father, the father, Caliban. Describe Ferdinand in relation to Prospero. Physically, what's the difference? Old beard over here. Chris Hemsworth. 
She's gone. Although by comparison, wouldn't any male float that way to her? Yeah. <laughs> when you have Caliban to go by. Yeah, I think pretty much, you know. Wouldn't have to be Chris Hemsworth. It could be some poor fat slob, you know. And she could still go, oh, brave. Yeah, exactly. John, oh, brave new world that has such, you know, beings in it. Okay? I might call him, she says. Let me back up. Prospero, no witch. It eats and sleeps and has such senses as we have. This gallant, which thou hast, uh, which thou seest, was in the wreck, and he's but something stained with grief. That's beauty's canker. Grief is beauty's canker. So what does grief do to beauty? Like canker, it eats away from within. It will destroy beauty. Thou mightst call him a goodly person. He hath lost his fellows and strays about to fight him. So why does he say he hath lost his fellows when he hasn't lost his fellows at all? Why doesn't Prosper just say, I want you to meet him separately? Well, what happens if she meets Stefano or Trinculo first? Oh, brave new world. Oh, you know, drunk to gills. I might call him a thing divine. Why? A thing divine. I could be entirely reading into this again. I'll freely admit it. But because I think this play is dealing so much with images of Eden and after Eden, what is Adam at creation? A thing divine made in the image of God. She's like, whoa. For nothing natural I ever saw so noble. Well, what's the natural thing she hath seen? Caliban. She's not including her father there, I don't think. Okay? So, man as he, she, we, are supposed to be. And is Caliban man as we? Unredeemed. Prospero. It goes on, I see. Notice, that's an aside. To the audience. As my soul prompts it. Spirit, find spirit. I'll free thee within two days for this. In other words, way to go, Ariel. This, this. Most sure, the goddess on whom these heirs attend. Why? Because what has just happened? Miranda appears. She's been invisible. Prospero was invisible. She just said, a thing divine, a goddess. Well, that's what we want, right? We want divinity with divinity. Vouchsafe my prayer may know if you remain upon this item that you will some good instruction give how I may bear me here. My prime request, first request, which I do last pronounce, is, oh, you wonder. If you be made or no. Probably back of his mind going, please, 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 yes, be a man, be a man, be a man. No wonder, sir, but certainly a maid. That is, no, no, I'm not a wonder. <laughs> Thanks, but, you know, I'm not that. <laughs> my language. She speaks in my language. Heavens, I am the best of them that speak this speech, where I but where tis spoken. In other words, this is heaven for him. Why? Because she's a wonder, <laughs> and she speaks my language. So, Prospero comes forward, talks a little bit, and Ferdinand says, well, I am Naples now. Why? Because he thinks his father has died. So I'm the new king of Naples, who with mine eyes never since that had beheld the king my father wrecked. Miranda, oh, a lack for mercy. Well, what did her father already tell him? 
Nobody died. So Ferdinand talks about the Dukes of Milan and others. And then he says, 444, at the first sight, they have changed eyes. What does he mean? We still use a phrase today. Love at first sight. They have changed eyes, though. Shakespeare's point on the old medieval notion that our eyes produce beams of light. This is why the quote-unquote male gaze or the female gaze can be so dangerous. Because if you gaze in somebody's eyes, those eye beams might twist. Eye intercourse, in other words. Okay? That can be a means of falling in love. So, Prospero addresses Ferdinand and says, A word, good sir. I fear you have done yourself some wrong. A word, Miranda. What makes my father so ingenious? Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't, don't drive him away, Dad. This is the third man that ere I saw, Caliban, Prospero being the first two. The first that ere I sighed for. In other words, she goes, Pity moved my father to be inclined my way. Well, what did Hermia say to her father? First play we read this semester. I would you saw Lysander with my eyes. Okay. And then Lysander said, you know, Demetrius, you have Hermia's father's love. Take that. Let me have Hermia's. Ferdinand, oh, if a virgin and your affection not gone forth, I'll make you, wow, is he fast. I mean, he's had what, maybe a dozen words? And he goes, baby, I'll make you queen of Naples. Of course, he has to get off the island, first of all. Prospero, whoa, 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 soft, sir, one word more. They are both in either's power. He controls her. She controls him. Why? Because each wants the other. Not sexually necessarily, though that's definitely implied. But this swift biz business I must uneasy make, lest too light winning make the prize light. In other words, this is the job of fathers. I've got to complicate the relationship a little bit. Why? What does he mean, else make the prize light? They won't seem as precious. As they won't seem as pressure, precious. She won't seem as worthy to him if she immediately gives him everything he wants, right? In other words, women, men, play hard to get. Because if you're gotten too easy, well, what's the fun in that? It's like hunting which I've never done, but you don't want the deer to come right up to you when you've got the hunting rifle. You want to go, run, you stupid deer. So it, it, there's at least a little bit of effort involved. You know, It's like hunting at a game reserve. Well, it's just ridiculous. If you're going to hunt at a game reserve, give the thing you're hunting a weapon to. Make it fair. You know? Or go hunting with a knife against a rhino. See how that works out, you know? So, they keep talking. Um, let's see here. Prospero, 479, just before the end of this act. Sheesh. Says, silence one word more shall make me chide thee, if not hate thee. What an advocate for an imposter. Hush. Thou thinks there is no more such shapes as he, having seen but him and Caliban. Okay, this is his complicating the relationship. No, no, you can't go out marrying him. He's the only other man you've seen other than me and Caliban. So maybe he isn't handsome. Maybe he is kind of pudgy, you know, and pasty looking, etc. Foolish wench, to the most of men, 
This is a Caliban. You leave this island with Ferdinand and you're going to see all these other men. You're going, to go, oh, even braver new world. And they to him are angels. Well, there's the great chain of being again. Humanity in the middle, angels above, beast below. Caliban's like a beast. Other men are like angels. Notice, where does that put Ferdinand? He's kind of down at the lower end of the human realm. My affections are then most humble. I have no ambition to see a goodlier man. In other words, no, really, Dad, it's okay. <laughs> He's perfectly fine with me. Okay? Ferdinand. Prospero says, obey, you're going to be bound up, etc. He says, that's fine. Might I but through my prison once a day behold this maid? All corners else of the earth let liberty make use of. Space enough have I in such a prison. That's his way of saying, I don't need to see any other women. If I can just see her for a little bit, then this prison is what? Space enough. What did Hamlet say? I could do what? I could be a king of infinite space bound in a nutshell if it weren't for his dreams. Okay? Okay, we'll stop there. I don't know how, but we'll do the next four acts on Tuesday.